Hi, my name is Kenna McClenaghan, and today I'm going to start with a few questions. How many of you, by show of hands, have seen Blade Runner? <laughs> All these people in the front row. Um, and how many of you have seen Ex Machina? Okay, a better, more of you. And how many of you have heard of the term tech noir before? <laughs> All right here. Um, <laughs> So that's okay if you don't. It actually refers to a hybrid genre of film to which both Ex Machina and Blade Runner belong. So if you raised your hands for one of those films, then you've seen a tech noir and you didn't even know it. So what I want you to take away with from this talk today is that tech noir can serve as a vehicle for feminist discourse. And the way that that can best be done is through the examination of the embodiment of the women in these films. So let's take a look at what tech noir actually is. This is what I like to refer to as the family tree of tech noir. So on the left side we have film noir and that happened during the 1940s and through the mid 1950s and neo noir is its modern reification. And on the other side we have science fiction with which we're all pretty familiar and one of its subgenres is technological science fiction which just means that we speculate as to how technology interacts with our society. So when technological science fiction and neo noir are merged together this is when we get a tech noir. And the really essential element that noir adds tends to be something to do with aesthetic. So these are some elements in film noir. And the ones that I'm going to focus on today are the femme fatale, which can be literally translated as the fatal woman, and chiaroscuro, which refers to high contrast lighting. Here we see both. So this is a classic noir femme fatale. She's very provocatively positioned. She has the accessory of the cigarette in her hand. The chiaroscuro is casting shades across her face. And she really epitomizes a central theme in noir, which is this idea that masculinity is in crisis and femininity is on the rise and is allowed agency. So she actually encapsulates this tension between fear and desire because externally she seems to be vulnerable because she is feminized but internally she may harbor murderous designs or have complex plots and try to manipulate people. <laughs> so this is one of her modern tech noir femme fatales. This is Rachel from Blade Runner, and a lot of the same kind of stylizations can be seen, but what is different about her is the glint in her eyes. This is what indicates that she is artificial to some extent. She's a cyborg. So I'll stop there because some of you might not know what that is. That is a cybernetic organism, which means that a body has both biological and technological components. So the reason Rachel's eyes have a glint in them is to show that they're artificial. And this kind of ramps up that tension between fear and desire that we see in a classic femme fatale, because we see technology as threatening, and she appears to be human, and yet is not entirely human. And that is where her threat lies. This is an example of classic chiaroscuro here, casting a shadow on a wall. And the same kind of image creates a silhouette that really outlines the body of a femme fatale and objectifies her further. In the same way, we see a detective protagonist backlit by a car light. And the very same image is seen in Blade Runner. But this light is coming from modern light sources and actually from commercials. So there's this idea that consumerism and commercialization are problematic in our society. So really what adds to a technological science fiction to make a tech noir is this aesthetic and this idea of the femme fatale. So let's take a closer look at some of these femme fatales and how they might serve us in getting at feminist discourse. The best way to do that is through Donna Haraway, a feminist theorist from UC Santa Cruz who wrote the Cyborg Manifesto. And in it she says, the dichotomies between mind and body, organism and machine, nature and culture are all in question ideologically. So let's break this down for a second. Mind tends to be associated with men, and body tends to be associated with women. And in the same way, organism, reproduction, biology, these are all things that are deemed feminine, while, te oops, sorry, while technology and uh, the machine and social progress, culture, these are all things associated with masculinity. So these are gender dichotomies that are problematized in the body of a cyborg because they are fused together. So this is where feminism can be intervened in, into tech noir. And this is true for Pris in Blade Runner, who is a cyborg. And here, her costuming really indicates for the purpose that she was made. So she was intended to be a pleasure model so that she could service other men with sex. 
And she is objectified in many ways throughout this film. Firstly, by the fact that she progressively strips off portions of her clothing. Secondly, by the fact that she is only seen in contrast to men in the film. And thirdly, by the fact that she is only surrounded by artificial female images that come in the form of dolls and mannequins. So here we see her holding up a mutilated Barbie doll. And this is representative of her rejecting these age-old stereotypes of femininity and beauty. She also uses this to her advantage in classic femme fatale fashion. She, being surrounded by these mannequins and dolls, disguises herself as one to lure in her hunter, Deckard. <laughs> in this scene, she has this leotard that is flesh-toned, and she has a bridal veil over her face, so she's seemingly vulnerable on the outside. But she's actually drawing in Deckard in order to kill him. So this is the clip that shows her agency. That might be a pretty bizarre scene to watch, but it actually has a lot of feminist propensities. So she may be flipping through the air and seemingly performing for the male gaze, but this is how she's fighting. This is how she's enacting her agency. And she lands on Deckard's head, squeezes it between her legs, and she twists it around in this kind of perverted birthing scene, which is really symbolic of the fact that she herself can't reproduce. And this really challenges the idea that women are, they essentially have to have biology and, rep and have to have the capacity for reproduction in order to identify as a woman. Then finally, when she flips his head all the way around, it turns into this imitation of a sex act. But this act is actually giving her dominance in this dynamic. So even though she's sexualized in these ways, she's granted agency. But beyond that, her embodiment grant, grants her agency inherently because it has these gender dichotomies in question. And this is true for the gynoid Ava from Ex Machina. And a gynoid simply refers to a female robot. And this is really accentuated by the fact that the fact that she's artificial is accentuated by her entire abdomen and arms and legs being transparent. And she has this gray mesh over the rest of her body, and artificial skin on her hands, feet, and face. And this is the first of three stages of the ways that she's attired. And she seems to be very childlike in this costuming. But she then progresses into dressing in a Sunday school floral-like dress, where her technological components peek out a little bit, and we still realize that she's a technological being. And it's not until the end that she applies her artificial skin wears this white lacy dress and tr is transformed into a human woman. And this is where she really assumes the role of a femme fatale because externally she seems to be vulnerable because she is feminized. She seems to be human and yet she is not. And inside, she's plotting her escape. So, like Pris, she is objectified throughout this film in many ways. The camera parses her body and glides over it as she challenges the camera as it's looking at her by looking straight into the lens. And her entire body, all of its technological components, are laid bare. She's also afforded close-ups that her male counterparts are not. And we get slow pans over really small parts of her body that really gets at this idea that's central to the femme fatale of this tension between fear and desire. We see the uncanny embodiment of her arms. All of her technology is there. We know that she's artificial. And yet, it's sexualized. She caresses her breasts right before she's about to apply her artificial skin. And this is really getting at what a femme fatale looks like when she is technologized in a tech war. Her body is also literally deconstructed. She, her body parts are dispensable. And she can get, put them back. This really, like Pris, gets at the idea that the female body is not what constitutes female identity. And like Pris, she is surrounded by the female image. She has this magazine photo of a model that she aspires to look like. 
she finds previous models of artificial intelligence hanging like discarded sex dolls in, in a cupboard. And she's also haunted by her own image. She's seen with many reflections of self around her. And she stumbles on a duplicate of her very own face. She's also literally entrapped in a glass cage while someone is assessing her, intellig her, assessing her intelligence. And her image is made available 24-7 via a video feed into both Caleb's room and Nathan, her creator's room, as is pictured here. And Nathan provides a whole other problem <laughs> because he holds up her brain bragging about the fact that he can supposedly program heterosexuality and gender into an artificial being. <laughs> and this really creates this um, harmful male maker culture because it indicates that there can be patriarchal control over gender expression. So even though both of these women are objectified in these ways, they have agency even just in their embodiment. So let's return to Donna Haraway's idea of how nature and culture are inextricably linked as she introduces this term nature culture. This whole idea can be translated to the term sex slash gender. So sex is something we tend to associate with genitalia, biology, something very fixed. Um, and gender is something we think of as perhaps more socially constructed and something that is about an external expression. But these two things are very much linked because they are both constructed to some extent. For example, we conduct our science in an androcentric way. So this concept is literalized in the body of a cyborg and in a gynoid because they have to perform their gender. There's, not, there's no nature, there's no biology that is dictating this female identity. They have to perform it. And that is where their agency lies. And that is why the femme fatale is so befitting of this concept. Yeah. So let me leave you with another Donna Haraway quote. She writes, the cyborg is a disassembled and reassembled postmodern collective and personal self. This is the self feminists must code. So what she means here is that we have to be aware as humans of our biology and our culture and how these things interact, how we're conducting androcentric science, how we're performing our gender because it's socialized. Um, and she's really calling us, beckoning us to see ourselves as cyborgs in that way. So the next time you go and watch a tech noir, I hope you'll think more critically about how women are embodied on screen, whether they're a human, a cyborg, or a gynoid. Thank you.